Coming up next on CBS Sports, the NCAA Basketball Championship. Hey there, it's Gary Parrish, live from a makeup room just outside State Farm Stadium in Glendale, Arizona. Welcome back to the Ion College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss Campbell fighting, Dodo Birds, Leaky Black. Ion College Basketball Podcast is presented by Jersey Mike's. Jersey Mike's, a sub above. Matt Norlander is here with me. He's actually inside the stadium. I'm outside the stadium, but we are both here in Arizona, where the National League semifinals were held Earlier today, they're now in the books. Game one, final score, Purdue 63, NC State 50. Game two, final score, UConn 86, Alabama 72. As some people predicted, two double-digit victories for the favorites. So Monday's national title game is set. We're going to touch on it very briefly at the end before we're out of here. And we'll have a full preview of Monday's title game on a fresh episode of the Allen College Basketball Podcast on Sunday. But tonight, for the most part, let's just focus on the national semifinals and let's do it in the order that the games were played. Norlander, Purdue turned it over a little more than usual. 16 turns, only 13 assists. That's not great. Braden Smith wasn't great offensively, at least. But the Boilermakers still never trailed in the game. Led by as many as 20, won by 13. Simply put, I think I had suggested to you earlier in the week, this might be what it looks like. It looked like a one seed playing an 11 seed. When you think of a one seed playing an 11 seed, that game played out about the way you would assume it might play out. Did you see it similarly? Uh, yes, except we didn't think uh, that it would be like this. Right. And by this, I mean Purdue winning a game in which it only scores 63 points. NC State, I mean, you could have pictured them not being all that competitive, sure, but I didn't think we'd get this kind of an irregular, or as I wrote, my column – was on uh, was on this game here uh, from from State Farm Stadium. It was just misshapen, but I, I I don't I don't know what to say other than Purdue has, in my opinion, and well, I do want to get into the game a little bit, but let me just go with the with the thesis of my column. I don't believe that Purdue needs to beat UConn on Monday night to have a redemption story. Just getting to the title game and making its first title game. And playing for a championship for the first time since 1969, to me, it has redeemed itself. It's going up against an all-time behemoth. Um, Agree or disagree? To me, it is. They have been cleansed. Anything happens on Monday, it obviously enhances the story. But I don't think it needs that to uh, to erase and to put off what happened last year against FDU. I agree with you. Um, If they win it, obviously, there's no conversation to have other than it's one of the. Um, the biggest college basketball stories of all time and in the sense of it went from that to this. Virginia, obviously, same thing. It would be remarkable um, if we were to get these two stories in such a close proximity of time, given that for so many years we never had a 16 beat a one to even create this possibility before. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but you're exactly right. Let's say Purdue does lose on Monday night. Um, you know, As long as they don't get embarrassed, and perhaps even if they do, you know what everybody will say. They lost to the best, not only team in the country, they lost to the best program in the country and maybe the best coach in the country. Uh, The Purdue jokes are over. At least I hope so. And if you're still trying to make them, uh, you're only laughing with a couple of other idiots. Uh, I would agree. Let's dig into the game just a little bit here. And for anyone watching live, your real ones, we appreciate you, especially if you're on the West Coast here. A reminder, we're going to have another pod on Sunday. So we are talking mostly about what we saw here on the court and the games that went down. So let's dig into a little bit here of Purdue versus NC State. Uh, Take you inside the, the stadium just a little bit. Uh, impressed by NC State's turnout from a fan base perspective. Really, really good job by that, by that program's fan base. They came in some big time numbers. That being said, Purdue is not messing around, and you could tell that this was this was a program fan base that was aching for this moment, and in a really impressive showing by Purdue's faithful there. They saw a game in which um, NC State made it interesting early. Purdue had some, un, you know, as you mentioned before with the turnovers, they had 16 second most in the game this season. Michael O'Connell, though, having the, the what I'm guessing is the hammy injury uh, that that took him out early. He did return at one point in the first half and he came back deep in the second half, but he was, he was obviously hampered. I don't know if he's healthy, if they win the game or not GP, but to me, it was 
Again, the defense, and I wrote this in my column as well. Yes, Edie had 20 points, 12 rebounds, four assists, two blocks. He just keeps giving you 20 and 10 games up and down. But Braden Smith didn't have a good game. He made one field goal. It was the three in the corner, all of about, I don't know, 25 feet from where I'm podcasting right now. That locked up the game. Huge crowd pop. But he had five turnovers. He had two backcourt violations. It's the defense, GP. NC State, 0.78 points per possession in this game. And and they and they got done to them what they had done to all these teams, you know they shooting below forty percent and not and 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 just being totally out of sorts there. And obviously credit to Purdue for for game planning that extremely well. Um, I talked to Painter afterward, and and they're just there's a very business like approach to this team. I'll also say this, and I do want your thoughts on the game and how it played out after they won the game. The way that this is set up this year in the stadium is normally you have teams go off different through different exit entrances, vomitoriums, however you want to say it. For whatever reason and how the footprint of the layout here, teams are coming in and out of the same tunnel. And so I had never seen this before and maybe it impacted how Purdue reacted. But Purdue and Alabama player or Purdue and NC State players were intermingling as they were walking off the floor. And so you would have thought I was sitting with or standing with a couple of the reporters. You would have thought like. Both teams had just lost the game. Now, part of that might be they don't want to, they don't want to be jerks in front of the team they just defeated. Maybe it is business like, but th- they are, they are ready. I mean, they came in ready. They're ready for Monday, and the defense again and again and again for Purdue keeps showing up. To me, it's it's that consistency that has put them in this place because they played. I'd say Purdue gave you a C performance, maybe a C plus yeah. performance overall. And yet you look up and it's 63 to 50 and it's just an, it's an, Oh, by the way here. So what were your thoughts on what you saw? Well, just circling back to, it looked like a one seed playing an 11 seed Purdue. I'll, I'll agree with you. Let's call it a C. I mean, I, I might go C minus, but uh, you know, they, they we're grading them on a Purdue uh, curve, but on that Purdue curve, they, they were not Purdue like they, again, the turnovers were an issue. Edie was, you know, 20 and 12, but that's, you know, he, that's not his averages. He didn't get his averages, and he was yeah. pretty – he wasn't as productive in the second half as he typically is. And then Braden Smith was a one of nine from the field. So, like, Edie doesn't give you his normal stuff. Braden Smith gives you, like, the worst game he's ever played. Your team, broadly speaking, turns it over, and you still win the game comfortably. Like, no problems, no scare. You're just coasting to the finish line. So, it just brings it into the NC State story. Oh, by the way, DJ Burns turned back into DJ Burns. You know, eight points, four ten wow. shooting. NC State turned back into NC State, which I also that's wrote right. the column. It just, and you know what? But maybe that's a little unfair because NC State and Painter even said we're facing a nine and zero team. We're not facing a team that was seventeen fourteen. Purdue forced NC State to become the team that it looked like in the final month of the season instead of the team that it had transformed into. I give I I give Purdue credit for that GP instead of blaming NC State. Yeah, I, I guess I would just say you know it's okay to be nuanced and and just tell the truth about the whole story. And here's the truth. NC State sucked for four months. That's the truth. They were not good. They finished 10th in their league. They had 14 losses. Um, their coach was maybe, and I emphasize, emphasize the word maybe, but maybe on the verge of, of, of being replaced by somebody else. And then what happened happened. I don't know how it happened. I don't know why it happened. Nobody saw it coming, but it happened. And then they had an incredible three-week run. ACC tournament, first week NCAA tournament, second week of the NCAA tournament, and that gets contracts extensions done, gets NIL deals done. It gets NC State to the Final Four. I bumped into a million NC State fans inside the stadium, outside the stadium. Um, they were having the time of their lives up until the game started. And then the game played out like they were playing a 14-loss team. Uh, as for Purdue side of things, I don't know if you saw the Braden Smith interview with A.J. Ross afterward, um, but he was great. And I, I loved that he was willing and comfortable talking to A.J., after a, a bad individual performance, and you mentioned business like it's the only way I, the only reason I bring it back up, he was just very, I don't know, calm and thoughtful. And AJ asked about, you know, the Fairleigh Dickinson game last season that ended their season. And he said, I, I respect Fairleigh Dickinson. Um, they beat us. But I also believe that if we played them 10 times last year, we would have beat them nine times. They just beat us that one time. And so what happened happened. But and I'm paraphrasing here, but, you know, we never thought that was 
um, a reflection of our team. And we always believe that if we play well, we should be one of the last two teams playing. And so now this is where we're at and we're looking forward to it. And I just thought he was able to frame the Fairleigh Dickinson thing for exactly what it was. The type of thing that can sometimes happen in a single elimination tournament of 40 minute basketball games, nothing more, nothing less. Too many people had used that as an indictment on Purdue, Matt Painter, Zach Eady, Braden Smith, Fletcher Lawyer, everybody involved. And it shouldn't have been because Zach Eady's better today than he was last year. Braden Smith is obviously better this season than he was last season. Fletcher Lawyer, this gets lost a little bit because his minutes went down, points yeah. went down, shots yeah. went down. He was better. Everything went down, but he was better because he was more efficient. It went from like 32% three-point shooter to a 44% three-point shooter, and he made some big shots in this one. Yes. Um, I just – I love the Purdue story, and I am glad that we have now seen it through to the national title game. I won't pretend to be certain about what's going to happen on Monday night, but I just like the idea that the Bowler Beakers have gotten to this point. And with that, if you got one last right, word just, on them, yeah, use it, word, and then we'll go gonna, to UConn. Yeah, 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 for sure. Just a couple nuggets here. Um, Edie's going to set the record for most points in a tournament, by the way, because right now he's got 140. The record is Glenn Rice with 153 and 89. Uh, he's going you know, he's, he's going to break that. And he is now the six with his six straight 20 and 10 game in the tournament. Longest streak since Elvin Hayes. He's the first player since Mello in 03 to have 20 points, 10 rebounds and four assists in a final four setting. Mello actually did it in the title game. Uh, continues. Braden Smith, I said he didn't have a great game. He didn't with the five turnovers. However, credit to our CBS Sports research team for this. He was the first player with at least eight boards, six assists, and three steals in the final four games since Grant Hills is the guy on the mic in this game uh, in 1994. Um, a little bit of an oddy one, but it, it, it speaks to how Lawyer and Smith in particular can really come up in different ways and help lift this team. And Purdue did not score a single point from the mid-range on, uh, on Saturday. 30 points came from beyond the arc, 24 were in the paint, and nine were from the foul line. Uh, they won it in unconventional ways. Painter told me he was really proud of – like, I'm going to paraphrase him. Basically, the scouting report broke down. Our team didn't break down. We did win ugly. And coming from the Big Ten, although they didn't have a lot of games like this, in a weird way it, uh, it really helped them. And then a final word for me on NC State, congrats on a wonderful season. You did have DJ Burns fade back, unfortunately. DJ Horn showed up. He had 20, but he couldn't lift it all on himself. Wolfpack fans, you had a wonderful Final Four run. Maybe you get back here in a year. Maybe you have to wait decades. We hopefully, hopefully that's not the case. But uh, but you just went. You ran into a better team with the best player in the country, and you tried to ugly up the game, and you just couldn't get quite enough uh, rhythm there. But uh, it was game was a stinker. I'm not going to try and talk around that, GP. It just wasn't a great game. Uh, but Purdue is a great team. And fittingly so, it will play for a title on Monday night. We'll turn our attention to UConn, Alabama next. But first, one word from our partners. The blackout mystery. Oh, welcome to March Madness. Oh, oh, oh. You just never know in the tournament who is going to shine. Stream March Madness live on any device, anywhere, and be ready for anything. Oh, yeah. What up, Anderson Cooper? Final score, UConn 86, Alabama 72. Norlander, at, at some point on this podcast or my other podcast or on CBS Sports Network or anywhere else I might talk, I, I said that Alabama, if Alabama were to go 16 of 36 from three, the way it did against Clemson in the Elite Eight, that I still wasn't sure that would be enough to beat UConn because I assumed UConn was going to be able to score no matter what, and I didn't think Alabama was going to show much resistance. In this game, Alabama shot 73% from three in the first half, finished 11 of 23 from beyond the arc. That's 47.8% from three. 11 makes, nearly 50% from the perimeter, and they still lost by 14 points. <laughs> that, it, this sort of played out the way I, I, I think. And listen, I'm not trying to pat us on the back. We often like talk about games, and this is the way it's going to play out. And then it, uh, you know, something different happens. But I, I think we were in agreement. Um, Alabama can maybe hang around by shooting incredibly well from the perimeter, but I doubt they're going to be able to show enough resistance on defense to to actually upset UConn. And UConn ends up shooting 50 percent from the field in the game. Yeah. Um, let me, let me go on Alabama first here and I'll, and I'll go, I talked, I did a walk and talk with Nate Oates after, um, the thing he was really frustrated by and like, you know, he admits like, 
UConn's a machine, but he was uh, so he was happy they were able to get. We got some good swings. Like we did have some good swings back and forth, which was really nice to see. Like they got they got themselves in a competitive game. It wound up not being a close game, but it was a competitive game. But you know, I started the second half. I'm going to shout my guy Jeff Borzello, who's sitting all of ten feet away right now. Um, he noted UConn started out 4-0. Then Bama 7-0, then UConn 7-0, then Bama 7-0, and then UConn 9-2. So we had some we had some good pendulum uh, bounces right there. But at the end of the day, end of the game, what Oates was bothered by was the lack of offensive rebounds. I mean, the they they did not have Nick Pringle didn't grab a single offensive rebound. Grant Nelson he had five, but they needed Pringle to step up big. They needed. Yeah, I think a little more production from Jaron Stevenson. He he was basically a non-factor, and it was a breakdown of the scouting report. Although UConn will force you to do that, Alabama had probably as good of a half as you could ask it to have. And even in spite of that, in spite of that, GP, it wasn't enough. I mean, I'm looking at the stats here. They were down four at the half, got got down by six more at the end for a seventy for a uh, what seventy eighty. That was about fourteen. It was 14. I think oh, I've got the I've got the under four there. Sorry about that. But um, but it is wild to me how Bama gave him a good game. It was entertaining, a competitive game, and yet not a close game. Yet again, UConn at this point is tracking toward, and I'm gonna save most of this for tomorrow, but it is tracking toward all time status if it can if it can win. Um it but I I do like this. I like the fact that it it faced resistance. It had it trailed a lot in the first half, um, and you got yet again, like Klingon had a couple of insane plays, um, but the starting five just keeps it just continually. GP, this team gives you so much balance. I mean, in this game, Castle at twenty one. I want to hear from you on Castle as a freshman in the spot was huge. Klingon had eighteen, Caravan fourteen, Spencer fourteen, Tristan Newton twelve. It was the first time since Duke in 94 that we had seen a team in the final four get its five starters have 12 plus points in a final four game Duke in 94 that was Jeff Capel Jericho Parks Chris Collins Antonio Lang and Grant Hill of course on the mic there Um, thoughts on UConn thoughts on Alabama thoughts on what you saw here and the Huskies faces a little bit of doubt and then you look up and, and and hello yet again 14 yeah. point win they've yet to have a game decided by four, fewer than 13 points since the start of last year's tournament so it was 56 56 with 1203 left correct and, and real quick real quick oats pointed it was the first thing oats pointed out to me when i when i shook his hand and walked back to the locker room and it was almost like i'm sorry for interjecting but thank you for reminding yeah. me of this it was almost he was almost like at a loss for words in terms of like no, no, no. Like I thought we were going to have this game. I thought we I thought we really really had a chance here. And then blink of an eye, tie game and we miss a couple of offensive rebound opportunities and you simply you cannot do that in this spot against this team because they will absolutely make you pay. Lo and behold, they did. Right. It's 56-56 like 12-03 left and from there UConn outscored Alabama 36-16 to win by 14. After 56-56, I believe it was immediately an 8-0 run by UConn. To, to create space again. And, 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 you know, that was that, um, on Stefan castle. I really think some five-star freshmen would be, or five-star prospects would be smart to look at what he did to look at the way he picked his college and what he decided to walk into because they're, you know, these, these five-star freshmen, you know, the world's so much smaller now. Like when, when I was a kid, and I'm assuming, even though you're younger than I, I'm assuming when you were a kid, our friends were mostly people who we went to school with or lived around. Like that, those were your friends. You couldn't FaceTime folks. You couldn't even text folks. You couldn't even email anybody. And if you tried to call your friend in California from, say, North All Mississippi. Right, take it easy. I was, I was able to email by like late middle school. Although it was okay. Very, very, I, don't, I, 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 I know. definitely, I was all set up with, with, with hotmail or whatever but continue Continue. yeah i didn't have i I don't remember i don't remember aol chatting until at least college and buddy i was pretty good at it if you don't mind me saying keep it going short show keep it going keep it i'm pretty good at it i was pretty good at it so here's my thing now you can facetime with anybody all over the world right i I watched my kids seven-year-old baseball game today 
from State Farm Stadium on my phone because that's where we're at with technology. All these five-star freshmen, they now the five-star prospects, they, they USA basketball, grassroots basketball. It doesn't really matter where you live. Uh, uh, most of the five-star freshmen in college right now have probably known each other for years. Some of them are friends, and I promise you I'm getting to a point. In the past, a lot of these freshmen have like teamed up and said, hey, let's go run things. Me, you, and him. We're all best friends. We're three of the top 15 players in the country. Let's go run college basketball as freshmen. And I'm not saying it's never worked. Kentucky won a national championship with a freshman heavy team. Duke did too. But certainly with the emergence of the transfer portal and name, image, and likeness, uh, being older is better in college basketball. And I'm not sure uh, taking three of the best freshmen in the country and building an entire team around them is the way to win in college basketball anymore. I'll be happy to be proven wrong someday. So here's Stefan Castle. He's not the best player on his team, and that's usually what five-star freshmen want to be. He's just a role player on his team, and that's usually not what five-star freshmen want to be. But he, either deliberately or accidentally, but either way, he got to this point. He picked a school where he was going to be surrounded, for the most part, by older rotation pieces. He was not going to be asked to be anybody's leading score, anybody's leading thing. And he's just come in and fit in and grown into a player who could have a magnificent impact in the national semifinals. It hasn't always been good for him. But as Dan Hurley said after the game, Stephon Castle, maybe he hasn't been the best scoring freshman in the country or the best anything freshman in the country. And that's those are my words, not Dan's. But what Dan did say is he's been a winning freshman from the jump all season long. And I just think that if you are a sophomore in high school thought of this way, junior in high school thought of this way, and you're still trying to make a college decision, I think what Stefan Cass was showing us now, and others have before, that maybe the the best path isn't to go align yourself with a bunch of other freshmen, because odds are in this era of college basketball, that might just lead to you getting your brains beating over and over again. Find a team that's missing a piece and go try to be that piece. That's what Stefan Castle is, and he might be a national champion in a couple of days. Correct. Uh, Castle on Saturday had one of the best scoring games by any freshman in the national semifinals in four decades. Carmelo had 33 and 03 against Texas. Derrick Rose, as you well remember, 2008, had 25. Uh, who did Memphis play in the semi, GP? Was that UCLA? UCLA. Yes. UCLA in the semi, and then Castle here with 21. Could have been even better. Kyle Boone is around here somewhere. He filed. Strong job. Yeah, he was actually, I think you were so locked in on a take before. People watching on YouTube I was, saw it. Um, he popped hey, in. But, he, again, he can't hear what you're saying, so then I muted. I told him, I said, come back over. We'll get your Castle take. He uh, he darted off here. But he has a sidebar. Read it at CBSSports.com, his Castle sidebar. If Castle hadn't had foul trouble, he probably would have had an even better game overall. It's so extremely impressive to see UConn go to him. The confidence, there's just one guy after another after another. And I have to at least mention Klingon real quick here. Obviously, we're going to get him even more tomorrow on the preview pod. He was the first player, and I told him this on my interview for HQ. Uh, I said, hey, listen, man, I'm going to tee up at the stat. He goes, what is it? What is it? I was like, no, I'm going to wait for it. He's like, what is it? I was like, no, wait for it. And uh, his eyes kind of popped a little when I said it. First player in a Final Four or a title game, to have at least 15 points and four blocks since Anthony Davis in 2012 did it in the semis against Louisville. He just can, and he's got a he's got a bad hand. He 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 uh, he dinged it up in practice, but uh, apparently he is obviously he's going to be good to go. He he showed himself well. They they played well, and UConn's they're well oiled, man. 86 72. Um, they were able to withstand every single piece of resistance from from Alabama and they, and Alabama came heavy they 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 really did but at the end of the night and what's just outrageous Connecticut finished at 1.37 points per possession 21 of 37 from two point range shot 40% from three point range Bama I, I I knew it needed at least 15 threes to have a chance wound up 11 of 23 overall Mark Sears you had yourself a heck of a game Grant Nelson had the dunk of the tournament uh, but unfortunately, it came up in a losing effort, ran into a behemoth, and now we get number one versus number two. UConn has managed to withstand anything and everything in its path here. And uh, and I've got a thought on – on. I know we're going to do a quickie, quickie uh, look ahead, but I'm going to save what Hurley told me on HQ for just after the break. If you got anything else on this game, we'd love to hear it. But 
I don't know what to say, man. It was a well, it was a quality game, and I thought we really might get it decided by single digits, but I refuse to pick UConn in a single digit game till I see it, and I still haven't seen it. Um, I'll, I'll just put a bow on it with this. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Derrick Rose because that's who I was thinking of when I was thinking of the Stefan Castle situation. To be clear, Stefan Castle is not Derrick Rose. Please, but similarly, Derrick Rose was a part of a freshman class at Memphis where he was always going to be the one freshman starter around a bunch of older guys to go try to win a national championship, to try to push that program to a different level. And in some respects, to a lesser degree, clearly to a lesser degree, but in some respects, Stefan Castle has, has become a similar thing. He's around older guys. He's the freshman starter. He's the five-star. He's the projected, I mean, we'll see, top 10 pick, lottery pick, top 20 pick, but he's yeah. going somewhere. He's going somewhere. And, and he has had – you know, I just think it, there's something to be said for, because keep in mind, even Derrick Rose, who was the number one pick in the subsequent NBA draft and the youngest MVP in history of the NBA, he was not their best player that year. It was Chris Douglas Roberts. He became their best player in the NCAA tournament, but Chris Douglas Roberts was the first team All-American. Derrick was comfortable with that. He didn't need to go be the star of anything. He just wanted to be a part of winning, or at least that was a part of, of the decision-making process. And Stefan Castle has now found himself in a similar situation, I guess, oh, let me do the math on this. 16 years after Derrick Rose was a starting freshman in the national championship game, surrounded by older people, uh, Stefan Castle is going to find himself in a similar spot on Monday night. When we come back, we'll look ahead briefly to Monday night's title game. It's a good one. First, one more word from our partners. Not a partners. I see you from afar. It's time for the madness. And CBS Sports HQ has your wall-to-wall -wall NCAA tournament coverage. We got your game highlights, expert analysis, and insights all the way to the Final Four. Start and end your March Madness coverage with CBS Sports HQ. Why did you? Why did you have to call it Nana like that? Uh, did you? So hold on. I thought I was muted. Was I? Did you hear it or no? Oh, buddy, everybody heard it. Okay. Well, I'm not as producing from like 50 feet over there. So there we well, go. Well, can he? Can he not hear me when I say he can. Work for I, I, he can, but I wanted to give him a little bit. Of, he's he's okay. over. On, he's over on the baseline. Very uh, straight. By the way, there's a people doing podcasts there. Podcasts there. Podcasts there. Podcasts everywhere. It's a. Uh, it's a heck of a scene. And, State Park. And I, I was going just so, just so people understand while I'm sitting in a makeup room in a yeah. trailer outside. They State wouldn't Park. let you in. They won't I, let you in the building. We, we actually tried. Like, we sent high-powered CBS people over. <laughs> like, like, we sent the big people over. And they, it was like, okay, GP. And they're like, who's GP? First, let's start with who's GP. Stop talking about GP. He's like he's, like he's eye and eagle. All right? Hey, wait, look at the field of 68. More of us. More <laughs> of us. Hey, are you guys concerned about where Alabama's headed? Hey, he, he's, are you, he wants to know because he wants to know if you're concerned about Alabama season now. Do you have, what's your level of concern for Alabama? Very, very worried. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> I love it when the field of 68 is concerned and worried about stuff. How, how, <laughs> how, how worried are we about <laughs> NC State season right now, Parrish? Like, I love – those are my friends over there, and they're just always worrying about stuff. I, I, just, no. I, just, wish they would, I just wish they'd be a little more stress-free. Just worry a little less. I just wish they worry. They're always worrying. I just – I worry. Anyway. I, it, make, it makes me worry about them. Okay. So, it, okay, yeah. So, we sent the big wigs over, yeah. and it was like – GP's got to be on uh, on television for about an hour and 20 minutes after the final buzzer. But then he just liked to walk back in State Farm Stadium and do a podcast. And they were like, we're not letting people back into the stadium an hour and a half after the game. And uh, and yeah. then I said, oh, I said, oh, I got an idea. We've got our CBS Sports Network set right outside the stadium. It's all lit up. Why don't I just do the podcast from the thing? And they said, you want us to keep a whole crew here? All and night you long? Yes. You said yes. I said, I'm not important enough to even make those types of suggestions, but I'm just wondering if that's something. And that was shot down. Like, oh, but I had a better chance of getting back in the stadium than I had them keeping lights on. And then it occurred to me, we have a trailer and I got makeup lights and maybe it's not the best background in the world. You're good. But like, I know, hey, people are used to, people on this podcast are used to seeing your shirts hanging in the background. Now we just got my shirts hanging in the background. The, I got those out of the shop three months ago. <laughs> okay, I stopped paying attention. Not forever. Um, <laughs> I stopped, I stopped paying attention. Three, three, okay. Three minute preview, we're gonna Monday night. Yes. Monday night, Glendale, Arizona, State Farm Stadium. I can't wait. Like Dan Hurley said post game, we have 
First off, let me ask you this. Do you agree with this? These are the two best programs in America the past two years. That's what yeah, Dan Hurley said. I got Randolph Childress just uh, – there we go. Randolph Childress. Ask it. Ask Randolph. Ask, no, ask, him, him, today. No, no, no. ask him. No, no, no. Ask him. Ask him. Ask him if he is worried about how, what is the level of concern with NC State moving forward. What's your level of concern with NC State moving forward? Feel the 68 podcaster. What's your level of concern with NC State season moving forward? It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, here you go. RC's among hey, the best. Hey, leave my ACC guys alone. I forgot I was talking. I I forgot I'm talking to an ACC legend. You are, you are indeed. Um, I should have asked him the level of concern about something that else. Is, that is correct. Uh, all right. So you agree yes. with well, this is the two best pro? Okay. So here's yeah. what we get on Monday night. Yeah. The two best programs for the past two years. The teams that are currently number one and number two at Ken Palm. On one side, you get the best college basketball player in the country for two straight years. On the other side, at the exact same position, a guy who is apparently now in the conversation to be the number one overall pick in the 2024 NBA draft. You've either got a back-to-back -back national champion on Monday or a lose to a 16 one year, win a national championship the next year story. That's awesome. And I think no matter what happens on Monday night, we're going to watch two coaches work and both of them someday – We'll join Bo Ryan in the Naismith Memorial yeah. Hall of Fame. I'm not going to sit here and tell you this is the best national championship game we've ever had. But what I will tell you is that it's a great one, and it is the best one we could have had this season, and I can't wait to get it on Monday night. Noodle on this for tomorrow. Don't want an answer right now. We did get Gonzaga Baylor 2021, but I'm wondering what you think will be the best. When was the last time we got a title game matchup as good as this? Maybe you'll say 21. Maybe you'll say 18. Maybe you'll say 15. Think about that one. Two, I talked to Hurley after. And he said, we'd been scoreboard watching all year because Purdue had a really good resume and we were kind of jostling for position for the one number one ranking in the AP poll. And competitive guy said, this is great for the sport. It obviously is. Uh, we have a, an awesome back-to-back -back here with the women's title game, South Carolina, Iowa. And now we've got Purdue versus UConn. Phenomenal moment for college basketball. We don't have to lie to ourselves here. If we'd gotten Alabama or NC State, we would have made something of it. It would have been interesting. This was the game. This is what was – this is the the feature for the sport. is a wonderful moment. We have Klingon versus Edie. Only the second time ever we have two seven-footers starting, squaring off. The other one was Elijah Wan versus Ewing in 84. But, so let me stop you there for a second. Are we 100% sure that Akeem Elijah Wan and Patrick Ewing were both seven feet tall? Yes, we're sure. Well, why? Sure. I, 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 think, I, I think we're sure. Yes. I take, take a take, take a, take a tape measure to Hakeem Olajuwon, and let's prove it. It's an incredible matchup, um, and I'm so thrilled that an event that doesn't always give us the best teams in the last game, we get it here, and we've gotten it semi regularly over the past decade. But we get it here, Houston. I see you. I hear you. Side yeah. note: UConn fans in the building. Kelvin Sampson won the coach of the year for USBWA UConn fans booing Kelvin Sampson on Saturday night because it wasn't Dan Hurley that won. This is that, this is that halftime of the Purdue, uh, Purdue NC state game. And it was like, it was loud. Oh, UConn fans never changed, man. Un a crazy moment there, but a phenomenal matchup. Again, we are going to preview this game, go in depth. We will have a Saturday morning look ahead podcast. At least want to acknowledge it here. And the fact that we get Klingon, Edie, Hurley, Painter, UConn, Purdue, top two teams, best two resumes. It's a phenomenal thing for college hoops. I'm, I'm so, so, so excited to get to cover that and see what unfolds on Monday. Are you surprised, and real quick here, because I was actually surprised by this. You've seen the number, right? It's six and a half. Are you surprised it's six and a half? Good call on this, because I did. They we did a hit for HQ, but I wasn't on that one, but I listened to the whole thing when they were talking it. Uh, I'm surprised it's – yeah, I like if you had asked me to guess, because UConn can't find a close margin – I would have right. blindly said, all right, they're going to put it at Purdue seven and a half. Um, I didn't think it'd Whoa. be double digits. You thought it'd be closer. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, I thought like no, no, no. Purdue it's, minus four. I would UConn like, keep, dude, UConn keeps covering. They keep beating I, teams by 15, 14, 25 points. I know Purdue's really, really good. And they're trying to strike that balance between uh, both sides there. But no, I actually thought it was going to be a little bit bigger than it was. Yeah. Um, you know, perhaps this is my bowler maker coming out, you know? Yeah. Perhaps this is my bullet maker coming out. Could be. Um, I, I also read somewhere or heard somewhere in my ear, perhaps from Anthony Billis, 
um, is 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 uh, I, I think this is the first time since 2015 we have one seeds against one seeds in both the yeah. men's and women's tournament. Oh, then that yeah 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 yeah. I was, I was, um, that's probably true. Just awesome. Yeah. Like we had Gonzaga Baylor 21, but that might have been yeah. And, and to answer yeah. your question, I you know if we're gonna rely on Kim Pom as a one versus two, well then that 2021 tournament was actually one versus two in yeah. the championship game, Gonzaga Baylor. And do you realize it's still one versus two with Gonzaga still number one yeah, and Baylor still number two? Season long data, that's what it'll do for you. That was a really, really, really good one. This is also a really, really, really good one. The game, what that didn't have, we'll get more into this tomorrow. What that didn't have that this one has is the battle of the bigs. Like there's just two giants that you can build this game around. And no matter how it goes, whether it's a buzzer beater, 20 points on one side, however it goes, this one will be remembered for such a long time because you had the player of the year making the title game against Klingon, who's destined to be a high pick. And, uh, yeah, can't wait for it. I can't wait to talk with you more about this at some point in the next uh, 11 to 14 hours. I don't know when we're doing our show on Sunday, but we will have a look ahead just to give you that taste as well. Yeah, we're going to get out of here, and then we're going to discuss when we're going to talk about solely Monday's title game uh, on the next episode of the Island College Basketball Podcast. That will be there for you at some point on Sunday. We'll let you know when we know. Shouts to David Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry Teagle, legend, Huck Larnell. Shouts to Rob Doster and Randolph Childress. And thank you guys once again for watching the Ion College Best. Shouts to Jeff Forzello. Shouts to, Shouts to Jeff Forzello. Yeah. Shouts to Kyle Boone. Shouts to everybody. Everybody. Yes. Shouts to everybody. It's a fun time. Thank you guys for watching, listening to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts. Apple, Spotify, more of us than there are of them. Oh, buddy, I can't tell you how many times I heard that walking around State Farm <laughs> Stadium. <laughs> and you, do you know what it's like to be walking around State Farm Stadium with your wife and just having strangers yell, GP, there's more of us than there are of them. Yeah. You did it's it a fun yourself. experience. It's we a fun didn't even experience. Get the fact that we watched Sting last night, saving it for Sunday's show. Saving it. We did, we did watch Sting last night. Save oh, it. we didn't even get to the fact that I, I seriously almost had I to go know. to the hospital last night. Save it. Oh, save, save it for it. Sunday show. I can't wait for Sunday show. We'll talk to you then. Until then, take care.